Yeah. Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. Isn't that something? Isn't that amazing to be able to say he is risen and then have your brothers and sisters next to you say he is risen indeed? In case you forgot, in case there is any doubt, today we celebrate the day that changed the course of history forever. Today isn't just about chocolate bunnies and Easter eggs. Those, those are really good, right? I like the little Cadbury ones. You know what I'm talking about? I'm the only one. Okay. So it, it's, it's not about that. It, it's, it's so much more than Easter bunnies, right? Today is, is a game changer. Today is the day we celebrate the single most important event in recorded history. Today is the day that we celebrate prophecy being fulfilled. Kept promises. Today is a day we celebrate that death has lost its sting. Today is a day that we celebrate that God has reconciled us, his enemies, to himself through Christ's death and resurrection. Today is a day that we can celebrate that Jesus' death on the cross paid for our sins and the check was cashed. The check cleared. It did not come back stamped insufficient funds. And we know that because the grave is empty. Today is a day that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ overcame death, was raised from the dead, and is now seated at the right hand of God the Father, who together with the Holy Spirit will reign forever and ever. That's a really good spot to say amen. But there's a lot of stuff that happened before we can count the victory. There's so many things that took place. There was hurt. There was pain. There was betrayal. There was humiliation and even abandonment. Does any of that resonate with you at all? Have you ever really been hurt by somebody that you care about? Have you ever been betrayed by somebody really close to you? Have you ever been abandoned by someone that you really loved? Have you ever been talked about by a close friend or family member? Or has anyone ever denied being your friend? Now, I don't want to read our scripture for today just yet, because first I want to tell you a story of what happened leading up to today, the last few days in the life of Jesus. You see, some of us met here Thursday night for Monday Thursday service where we explained, Pastor Chris did a great job in explaining that Jesus gave us a command. He gave a command to his disciples and to us that says, a new command I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. And then as he sat with his 12 disciples in an upper room, he sat down with them for a meal. He took the bread and broke it and he said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. And when he had given thanks, he gave them a cup and he said, drink of it, all of you, for this is the blood of my new covenant, which is poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus, that very same night, tells Peter, he says that he will deny him. And Peter says, no, no, I'm going to ride with you until the wheels fall off, Jesus. I'm not going nowhere. Christ says, Peter, before the rooster crows tonight, not once, not twice, but three times you will have denied me. And then Jesus goes off to the garden and in Gethsemane, he, he prays and he tells his guys, he says, hey, I'm going to go off and pray, but I need you to do one thing. Stay awake and keep watch. I need you to have my back. They had one job to do, and they fell asleep. They let him down. So Jesus is betrayed. Judas sells him out, like literally sells him out for 30 pieces of silver. And as he's pointing him out to the Roman soldiers by giving him a kiss, Jesus looks at him in the eye and he says, friend, do what you came to do. Can you believe that? He still calls him friend. 
They arrest Jesus, a fight breaks out, things get crazy, and Jesus says, relax. Do you not think that I can appeal to my father? And he will at once send an army of angels to get me out of this? But then how would the scriptures be fulfilled if he did that? Jesus is taken before the high priest and the council, and they grill him for a while. But Jesus remains quiet. He doesn't say anything. When just a few nights before he was flipping tables over, now he remains quiet and still. So what do they do? They spit in his face. They hit him. They, they slap him. And they make fun of him, saying, who hit you? Which one of us hit you? And while this is happening, his ride or die Peter is outside in the courtyard. The same Peter who said that he would be with Jesus until the wheels fell off. A small servant girl comes up to him and she says, hey, you were also with Jesus, the Galilean. And he said, no, nah, man, that wasn't me. You got me confused with somebody else. Another servant girl comes up to him and says, this man was with Jesus of Nazareth. And he says, I swear it wasn't me. And then some of the bystanders come up and say, you know what? Your accent gives you away. You were with Jesus of Nazareth. And he says, I swear, I do not know that man. And just as he finishes saying that, a rooster crows. And he remembers what Jesus had said. And he begins to cry bitterly. Jesus is taken before Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor at that time, and he is accused falsely. Again, Jesus is questioned, and again, Jesus remains silent. But Pilate's wife tells him, Jesus is a righteous man, and he should have nothing to do with hurting him. So Pilate says, you know what? I'm going to put this back in the hands of the Jews. Every year at this time, the Jews are allowed to have any single prisoner they want released back into their custody. So this is the perfect time to get Jesus, our Savior, released back to their people, right? This was the opportunity for all those people who had just laid out palm branches the week before and received him in Jerusalem by saying, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. This was their chance to get him released. This was an opportunity for all those people that he'd healed for all those that had witnessed his miracles to take a stand and get him released. To march in the streets with their picket signs and say, let Jesus go. But instead, they yelled, crucify him. Crucify him. Crucify him. So what does Pilate do? Pilate takes water and he literally says, I wash my hands of this man's blood. Jesus is stripped of his clothes. They made fun of him. And guess what? They spit on him again. They struck him on the head again. They slapped him and led him to the cross to be killed. He was so beat up and so weak that he couldn't even carry his own cross. And someone had to help him. Pastor Chris taught us the other night that his own mother did not recognize him. And he challenged the mothers that were in the audience. Mothers, how would you feel if your child was so beat up that you would not even recognize the child whom you gave birth to? He was so beat up he couldn't carry his cross. Somebody helped him. They put him up on the cross and they waited for him to die. Literally waited for him to die. A slow, miserable, and excruciating death. One of the most horrible ways to die. And after he's taken down from the cross, after he's dead, they bury him in a tomb. And the Pharisees said this. They went to Pilate and they said, hey, this imposter, this imposter said that after three days, he would rise. How's about we put some guards outside the tomb just to make sure that his friends do not steal the body and say, hey, guess what? He actually rose from the dead. Let, let's, let's cover our bases and make sure that that doesn't happen. So they went. And they sealed the tomb and placed guards outside to make sure nobody would steal the body. Now what? That was Friday. 
Saturday, the world was quiet, but Sunday, Sunday's not a coming. Sunday is now here. This is the third day. But it seems that those people that were the closest to him had forgotten. They either didn't believe Jesus or were too caught up in fear as they were hiding to remember all that he had said and promised. Which brings us to now. The Gospel of Matthew. Chapter 28, verses 1 through 10. If you have your Bibles, please open them up to Matthew 28, starting at verse 1. And I would ask kindly, if you are able to, if you could please stand with me and join me for the reading of God's Word, starting at Matthew 28, verse 1. If you don't have a Bible, it's inside the bulletin towards the back. Let me get a solid amen when you're there. Yeah, that was weak. Let me get another solid amen when everybody's there. Amen. I can dig it. I can dig it. And the Word of God reads, Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came down and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, as he said. Come, see where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. And then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. And there they will see me. People of God, this is the word of God. Please be seated, family. So th there's some important things going on that I want to go ahead and, and talk about, but I won't stay too much, long, too much longer on them. Um, one of the things is this. People ask about Saturday being the Sabbath, and if that's so, why do we come to church on Sunday? Because it's right here in verse 1. The very first per part of verse 1 says, Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of of the week. You see, the resurrection of Jesus now sanctifies the first day of the week as the new day of worship, which means we now worship on Sunday instead of Saturday. You'll often hear of us referring to Sunday as the Lord's day. We celebrate the day that he resurrected, which was a Sunday. And the second part of verse one, it says, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. God chose the women to reveal himself to. Jesus didn't show himself to the men at first, but instead to these faithful sisters. These women were loyal to Christ. They demonstrated exceptional love. They were with him at Calvary when he died, and they were with him at Joseph's garden when he was buried. And now, early Sunday morning, they were there to look at the tomb and to see that everything was in good order and to anoint the body of Christ. Verses 2 through 4 says this. It says, There was a great earthquake, and an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and rolled back the stone, and his appearance was like lightning, and his clothing white as snow. And what did the guards do? They played possum. They played like they were dead, or they fainted. One of the two, I don't know. But I'll tell you one thing. They weren't standing trying to defend the angel or Christ from resurrecting. You ever notice that in the Bible, it frequently mentions earthquakes, kind of like, like God is trying to get the attention of the people with earthquakes and thunderstorms and, and all kinds of crazy things that happen in nature that only God can do. Think of this. There was an earthquake just a few days ago when Christ died, and the veil was torn from top to bottom, giving us direct access to him. And now, there's another earthquake when Christ is resurrected. 
Those guards, the very same ones that were placed at the tomb to make sure that Christ's uh, disciples would not steal his body from the grave, got scared. They got scared. They were frightened, however you want to call it. They didn't do anything. I don't know if they fainted, like I said, or if they passed out, or if they were just plain dead to make sure nothing happened to them. But they did not do anything. What would you do if you seen an angel come from the sky? If the earth quaked, if the earth quaked and trembled and shook, and you see a person there like lightning with his clothing as white as snow, I'd probably play dead too. The good thing is I know what team I'm on. I'm on team Jesus. Hashtag it however you want. T- hashtag team Jesus, amen? amen? Hashtag he is risen. Hashtag he is risen indeed. However you want to call it. The empty tomb changes the course of history forever. Verse 5, the angel tells the women, not the guards, the angel tells the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus, the one who was crucified. The angel empathetically encourages the women. And verse 6, he says, he is not here, for he is risen. As he said, come, come see the place where he lay. Come, come inside, look, this is where he was at. That's his clothes right there on that rock bed. That's where Jesus was at. Come see, he is no longer here. Family, this changes everything. Why? Because Jesus called it in advance. He said he would be resurrected from the dead. Just two chapters before, in Matthew 26, 32, Jesus said to his disciples, shortly before he was betrayed, he said, but after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. And in Psalm 1610, in the Old Testament, it says, for you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or hell, the underworld, or let your Holy One see corruption. Jesus had to raise from the dead to fulfill the scriptures and all the many ways that he was promised to come hundreds and hundreds of years before. He healed the sick, he gave sight to the blind, he made the lame walk, he raised the dead, and now he himself was raised from the dead. And if none of those things gave him credibility, try denying this. He's not just a man of wisdom. He's not just a holy man. He's not just a prophet. He's not just a healer. He's not just a rabbi. He is God. Let me say that one more time. You guys got really quiet. Jesus Christ is God. And because God chose to step into the very same world that he created and live amongst us and suffer as we did and love us despite our ugliness and love us enough to go to the cross and forgive us, forgive us over being dumb and making stupid mistakes and decisions over and over again. Only he could love us right. And he did it to teach us how to do it. He did it to show us how to love. He modeled it out for us. So now the women know that Jesus is raised, right? It's all coming together now. The, the, the picture starting to come together and they're starting to remember things. What do they do? Who do they go? Who do they tell? Where to start? Well, verse 7, the angels tell him. Verse 7 and 8, the angel says, go and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And they listened to him. And running as fast as they could, as they're running to tell Jesus' brothers, his disciples, that he's alive, what happens in verse 9? They see Jesus. Jesus meets them on their way to go tell his disciples, and he says, greetings. Are you kidding me? Greetings, the resurrected Christ. He says, greetings. Greetings. How would you react? How did they react? Let me tell you what what verse 10 says. I'm sorry, what verse 9 says. It says, they came up and they took hold of his feet and they worshipped him. They didn't hug him. They didn't shake his hand. It says, they fell to his feet and they worshipped him. I think of what happened with the Magi when they first came to see the born, the newborn savior. They fell at his feet and they worshiped him with gifts. In verse 10, Jesus says, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee and there they will see me. Again, Matthew 26. 
After I have been raised, I will meet you in Galilee. And indeed, they did. Indeed, they saw Jesus. Over 500 eyewitnesses saw Jesus. And that, my friends, is the story of Easter. And if anybody tries to deny it, you have an empty tomb. You have multiple eyewitnesses that saw Jesus alive. This is just a piece of all the people that saw him after, after he had been risen from the dead. That is why death has lost its sting. Death is not the end. For those of us that believe it is just the beginning, knowing that in the same way Christ was raised from the dead, we too shall be raised with him. 1 Corinthians 15.55 says, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? It doesn't hurt anymore. It doesn't matter. Because death isn't the end. Death is just the beginning. Well, that's great, Pastor Rudy. That's a whole lot of information now. What does that have to do with me? How do I apply that to my life today? What does that mean to me at work when I go home to my job and with my neighbors? Three things. Feel free to write them down. The first one is this. Our identity is not in what the world says or thinks of us, but what Jesus did for us. My identity, your identity, is not in what people say about you, but in what Christ did for you on that cross. Think about that. The world thought that their Jesus problem was over, that he was dead. But Christ overcame the grave and showed them what he was about. Don't let the enemy whisper in your ear that Christ is dead. Instead, believe the over 500 witnesses that saw him alive. Believe Thomas. Doubting Thomas. Believe him who actually had to stick his hand in his side and stick his fingers in the nail holes in his hands that he would believe. Our identity is in the empty grave because the empty grave showed that Christ kept his promises. And if Christ keeps his promises, we've got nothing to worry about. Well, only if you believe in him. You have nothing to worry about. Only if we've placed all of our trust in him for our eternal salvation do we have nothing to worry about. So one, our identity is not in what the world thinks of us, but in what Jesus did for us. Two, we must worship Jesus always. We must worship Jesus always. When Jesus appeared to the women as they were on the way to tell his disciples that he'd risen, It says they fell at his feet and worshiped him. When the wise men came to visit the newborn Savior just 33 years before that, it says in Matthew 2 that they also fell down and worshiped him. How do you worship Jesus today? Do you even worship Jesus today? How would those people that know you the best How would they describe the way you worship Jesus? The same one that rose from the grave. Would somebody be able to look down and say, yeah, he got down on his feet and worshiped Christ. Yeah, she got down on her feet and with her her tears and hair, she washed his feet. What would people say about you and how you worship Christ? Three, we must run and tell everyone. We must run and tell everyone about Jesus. It says the women ran quickly with great joy to tell his disciples the great news. We need to tell everybody the good news of Jesus. This same message of Jesus coming to us. God in the form of a man tempted in every way we were, yet he never sinned. He willingly went to the cross. He accepted the hitting, the spitting, the mocking, the torture of dying on the cross for all those who believe. Think about that. Think of everything he endured for the sake of us. And somebody cuts us off on the road and we're already telling them they're number one. Somebody bumps into us at the supermarket and we turn around and make a crazy face at him because he bumped into us without saying, excuse me. Who do we think we are? But it didn't end there. It says Christ rose from the dead. And he ascended into heaven and is sitting now at the right hand of God the Father, 
reigning together with the Holy Spirit as the triune God forever and ever. The Gospel of Matthew ends just a few verses later with the Great Commission and Jesus telling all of his disciples to go out. Go out and make disciples of all nations. It didn't say stay comfortable. It's saying go out and make disciples of all nations. Making, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teaching them all that I have commanded you to do. That's a commission. It's not the great suggestion. It's the great commission, what he's telling us to do. Who are you telling about Christ? Who are you running to in an excited way like these ladies, telling them about what Jesus has done for you? If you've been doing a poor job of this, I, I get it. Sometimes I feel like, like I'm not doing a great job either. And there's a huge margin for improvement. But Christ is the good news. That means that we have a chance to do it over and over again because he paid the price for us. We belong to him. So if nothing else, remember these three things. One, your identity is in Christ. Your identity is in the empty tomb. Your identity is in that Jesus lives. Two, we must worship Jesus always. And people need to see us doing so. And three, we must run to tell others in your own way. We must. Your identity is in Christ, not in what the world says. We must worship Jesus at all times. And we must run to tell others about him. Amen? Join me in praying, family. Adorable Redeemer, Thou who was lifted up upon a cross art ascended to the highest heaven. Thou who as a man of sorrows was crowned with thorns art now as Lord of life wreathed with glory. Once no shame more deeper than, my, than thine, no agony more bitter, no death more cruel. Now no exaltation more high, no life more glorious, no advocate more more effective. Thou art in the triumph car leading captive thine enemies behind thee. What more can be done than thou hast done already? Thy death is my life. Thy resurrection is my life. Thy ascension is my hope. And thy prayers, my comfort. <laughs>